how to invest in Malaysia, specifically the best stock sector in Malaysia to invest into high IMCF. What sectors is resilient? So as you see, there's a bit of a typo over here. It's resilient, not resilient. Healthcare has always been very resilient. The only thing is you have to look at the sector, the exact company you invest into, whether they are the major market player or have a lion's share of the pie or not. Second thing is logistic. Now, it's not a sexy sector to invest into, but you know that with the emergence of e-commerce, you know, if you go to any of those uh, logistic providers like GDEX as a public listed company, you know there's always a long queue. So that also includes uh, logistic reads, which is serving all their logistic customer, renting out their space to their logistic customers. Now, of course, e-commerce, I don't need to explain that already. And any ancillary services that support e-commerce, such as logistics sector. And of course, infrastructure and utility. Although, although they might have a compressed margin or revenue, uh, when you know some utility company like TNB gives some you know electricity utility discount. But again, this is just a, a short-term uh, pay. Uh, infrastructure company only has always been a very have a very consistent income or revenue. The only thing is whether they make more money or less money is depending on how good they are controlling their costs and how efficient you know is their organization is run. If they are not run very efficiently, then even you know a very very profitable businesses just like you know Malaysia Airlines could also file for file, go into like a financial trouble right now what are the sectors to avoid as of 2020 hospitality tourism no need to say property sector in Malaysia uh, is has always been a question of affordability and uh, I think property developer uh, during the MCO or lockdown period in Malaysia you know that they have been running all those MCO campaigns to actually attract buyers to buy more properties but you know, in other words, I think property developers are just being very desperate. Plus, if you understand, you know, the property market in general in Malaysia, it is in a state of, you know, there's a lot of overhang units, there's a lot of oversupply properties that are being built and cannot sell. So in that sense, I do not think property sector is the sector to invest into in Malaysia. How about finance? Well, finance sector has always been, you know, the sector, the stock sector in any stock market that becomes the bellwether of the economy. So when the economy goes down, finance sector is or has always been the first to actually plunge uh, and in the context of 2020 you know that there has been giving like uh, six months uh, suspension of all some of the house payments and all that and then with this uh, interest rate all time low so the profits for a lot of banks are being squeezed now at the time of this even if you ask the bank's management or CEO they wouldn't be able to tell you how their bottom and top line is going to be impacted in due to COVID-19. It's yet to be seen. But generally, finance sector, when uh, when the interest rates are low, you know, when people actually have difficulty securing loans, so, you know, one of the bulk uh, revenue or profit is made from all those loans, right? So that is where uh, finance sector is also having a very hard time. Now, how about construction sector? Now, with this lockdown and all going on, with this overhang kind of situation for property market, you know, construction when it comes to residential property will face a challenge. Uh, however, when it comes to infrastructure uh, construction, now, I guess that depends on how much money the government is willing to allocate in every year's budget, right? In, you know, for the past recent of years, yeah, I mean, there are infrastructure projects, but some infrastructure projects, if it get cancelled, then, you know, construction sector or the companies that actually are involved in some of those construction projects will have a very bearish outlook, right? And oil and gas, as you know, uh, it is a commodity and the price of, you know, when it's in good times, it's, it's very profitable when, when the, the oil uh, price barrel, a price uh, oil price per barrel is down, you know, oil and gas sector, people will be squeezed and, you know, retrenchment could be actually coming uh, because oil and gas is a sector whereby there's a lot of money needs to be operating in that sector, right? And this, all these uh, oil and gas players, they are actually, they wouldn't have job unless they are waiting for jobs for, for example, Petronas in Malaysia. Now, imagine if Petronas is going to actually tighten the water pipe and then more less water will flow to these uh, so-called contractors or subcontractors for so Petronas or vendors, right? So you know that people working in this sector will face a challenge as well. And then this company will generate less revenue and then the stock price go down. So probably this is not the best sector in Malaysia when it comes to stocks market to invest into a plantation. I'm not an expert in plantation. Therefore, uh, I cannot comment much about it. But just so you know, unless you are working in this sector, you know how your company, the company when it comes to a plantation sector is a major player. It actually constitutes you the lion's share and you know, of the market share you probably do not want to dabble in the plantation sector so what is your safe sector now 
I'm not saying this is completely safe. So these are the sectors that you could probably discover some gem or good companies that is still not only will survive, will thrive in an economic crisis like what happened in 2020. Uh, one of it is technology or, or SaaS software as a service sector. So you have to look whether this, uh, com this uh, software or technology company, they need to be depending on government contracts or not uh, to derive most of the revenue. Let's say, for example, let's say Pistarian, right? So if, for, for example, it is Pistarian and then if they lose their, their major government contract, then the revenue will actually be impacted. Compare that with uh, uh, technology company like Zoom, Facebook and Google, you know, people are just spending ads, spending uh, most of the revenue are derived like Google and Facebook from advertisement and for Zoom, it's because it's a subscription basis. Uh, people are working from home and then education are using that uh, to deliver their classes online. So these companies uh, will be doing good. So on a case by case evaluation sector. Now REIT is something I like to, to talk about because REIT, yeah, certain sectors like office sectors and maybe retail most REIT will be impacted because less people are going out, uh, shops are closing down, uh, so they derive less rental from their tenant. But again, what a lot of people do not know is REIT is not only about shopping, more about offices. Remember I said about the logistic REITs, now these are actually doing very well and also there are certain REITs that are tapping on the trend where people are working from home. Yeah, some REITs are actually thriving because people are working from home. How crazy is that? If you want you know, to know more about what I just talked about, just leave a comments below, right? I'll, I'll, I'll read and reply any comments uh, personally. Now, the other thing is about consumer goods. Again, evaluate case by case basis. For example, when it comes to consumer goods, you know that probably when people don't have less money to spend, uh, the last thing that could be on their mind is buying new clothes. So company like Cardini would be impacted. But when it comes to consumer goods, uh, like you know Nestle, right? Uh, those food, food, uh, those, those food producer. Yeah, this is a basic needs of every human. So this will be still doing well. Now, how about industrial goods? You also have to evaluate on a case by case basis. Now, if, let's say I would consider uh, glove as an uh, as an industrial goods, right, rather than uh, healthcare sector, right? Now this will be doing very well because you know uh, hospitals and healthcare sector are using all those uh, industrial goods. But industrial goods, um, when it comes to the material that is used to, to do a lot of those construction in Malaysia. Now, if construction industry actually slows down, then the, in the sector or the company that make industrial goods will also be impacted because there will be less demand. So these are the few sectors that you have to evaluate on a case by case basic basis. And I want to tell you why there is no, a, there's nothing like a forever true answer. Now, if you look at uh, my, my earlier video, video on the best stock sector to invest in Malaysia that is popping up in the upper uh, right hand corner over here. I made that very popular video some time ago. It still have very good pointers over there. So I suggest that after you finish this video, check out that video as well. Now in that video, I make it earlier. You might have noticed that what I just shared with you in this video might be different. And that is why I say the uh, the time when you ask what are the best sec stock sector to invest in Malaysia, the answer could be different at different times because number one, investment landscape changes. Number two, economy landscape changes. By the way, if you want to understand more about how to make money through investment in an economic crisis okay, or economic downturn, just check out another very popular video when I talk about economy. How does this economy affect your investment in the upper in the upper right hand corner popping up, popping up over here after this video is end, right? So investment landscape changes, economy landscape also changes and also business landscape also changes. Come COVID-19, a lot of this actually changes. So these are the three factors combined that will really dictate your investing outcome. And of course, you might have some expectation. Everybody want to make a positive or good return from investing. But the fact is this, in investing, you lose money, okay, at sometimes not because you are dumb, you are not good enough, you are not talented enough. It's not even because you overlook anything. You might have done everything right in investing, but because of changing landscape in investment, economic and businesses trends, it caused you, you know, to not able to catch up, you know, if you are not, you know, if you are not in a finance field, that is why when the economic and business landscape shift, and you don't know it, you don't know how to reposition your portfolio, that is where you might lose a lot of money. Now, to prove my point, why some of it uh, uh, even cannot be predicted is because in the in the first quarter or second quarter of 2020, you see, the best investor in the world, Warren Buffett, lost so much money investing in this traditionally very resilient company like banks, like American Express, which is a credit card company, Coca-Cola with a very, very strong branding, right? And General Motors, which is like the official national car maker in the US, right? So he lost, you can see each of these stocks, he lost about 40, 50%, 30 over percent, 20 over percent. He also lost so much money, billions, billions of dollars by holding onto 
these very good companies, whether you look at it from branding standpoint or from value investing standpoint. So is it even the best investor in the world will lose money, not because they are not smart, not because they are dumb or not talented or because he didn't actually do enough homework. And that is part and parcel, okay, the expectation that you, you want to have an investing. Sometimes you lose, sometimes you win. But if you win more than you lose, then net of it is that you still win. If you can look at it again, uh, one of the major loss for Warren Buffett, the best investor in the world, which is not only a paper loss, but a realized loss is when he actually invested so much money into all the major airlines in the United States. And you know, by now we know that the airline industry or aviation industry is really on the verge of collapse. So what I want to tell you is even the experts cannot predict this and are not even um, immune to this. So how, how can we actually solve this? Well, we really cannot really solve this. The only thing you can do is that uh, if what you have expected to happen did not happen because they are due to certain certain factors you cannot control. You just have to pivot accordingly. Think of a ways, right? Maybe rebalance your portfolio from investing standpoint. Uh, maybe when to reallocate your portfolio, just like what Warren Buffett did. He's not going to wait until the airline sector recover because that time waiting for a few years, it actually means lost opportunity cost. So what he did is he rather bite the bullet and just sell all his airline stocks at a loss and move on from there. So even the best investor in the world are doing this. So I think that is a lesson that everyone of us should take and everyone of us as an investor should be prepared for. Because just one year prior to that in 2019, uh, in this news, right, in 2019, Berkshire Hathaway would have never seen COVID-19 coming. Never, right? COVID-19 even doesn't exist yet. That's why they go big on airlines. And then less than a year, they suffer like huge, huge losses. And then he decided to just liquidate everything, just bite the bullet and take the loss and move on. So this is a graph that I really want to internalize. You see, when we talk about value investing, a lot of people thought value investing is the holy grail. Once you know that, you will not lose money. That is so untrue. Because it's true that if you, you are a know-nothing investor, you are and you only invest based on rumor and hearsay, you're likely very easy to, to lose money. But as you become a more informed and advanced investor as well, right? It doesn't mean that the more you know, then you know double or twice the knowledge than before, then you stand to actually get double the return from your investment. It doesn't really work that way, right? To a certain extent, there's a saturation, you know, when it comes to doing this fundamental analysis of value investing methodology. So don't take it too hard on yourself. This is again, very expected and very normal. So uh, another thing that I want to share with you is in April 2020, can can really value investing make sense of this or not, or even prevent this, right? A company like Genting and Genting Malaysia, it is almost impossible, you know, as a company that, that, that runs a casino business, how can they actually lose money? Not possible, just, but the stock still drop a lot because all their main business generating uh, premises are being closed, casino are being closed. So this is the fact, right? Value investing wouldn't save you from losing money. It could actually give you a head start, but then you would want, still want to see this kind of these things happen, what I call a black swan event. So what you can really do uh, when it comes to investing is that you can, yeah, I mean, uh, I would suggest you always start with a do-it-yourself DIY and then, uh, you know, you just try it and you see how difficult or how hard it is or how lucky you are. So basically you can actually do a lot of trial and error. Okay, and uh, some of those errors if it will cause you to lose money. So when you lose money, just uh, just treat that as like you are paying a tuition fees, right? But the other way that the smarter people do is that they leverage on other experience, uh, which means that they probably want to actually go through some courses and all that. At least they get the fundamental correct. It's not a guarantee you wouldn't lose money, but at least fundamentally the basics, they get it right. Okay, they are no longer speculating. So my point is basically to actually start off with a new skill or learn a new skill. It has always been like that, right? You go to university, you go to college to acquire a new skill. You have to pay for the tuition fee. So you pay either way. You either pay it, pay a tuition fee by learning on your own, or you actually shortcut your way, like attending some courses. So uh, you know what are the common mistakes to avoid and that shorten your learning curve. For example, one of the read method course that I am running, you know, for more than 10 years, right? And of course, the third way you can do is uh, basically you outsource it. Uh, and this is, don't take it wrong because when you outsource it, not because you are incapable or not because you are lazy. It's because if you are not a specialist into this, you should always outsource the things that you don't enjoy doing or when you are not the best in what you do and you just focus on the best your, of what you do. Maybe it's your job, your business, because that is your main income generating activity, right? Earn most of your income from there because there's no investment in the world that can actually generate, you know, as good return as your income. Okay, the only way it can do that is that your investment have grown to a sizable amount that it can generate dividend or income or all that, that will eventually replace your active income. But when you're just starting out, normally your active income will be easier to attain rather than 
what your investment can give you. So it's all right to actually outsource it, right? Uh, have someone to do that for you. Don't feel bad. It's not because you are lazy. It's just because you are smart enough to tap on your strength to do what you enjoy and what you are expert in doing, generate a lot of money or income from there. And then these are the side thing that, you know, just pay someone to do it 1%, 2%, you know, let them take that, right? Because nobody will actually do things for free, right? You don't work for free. So you cannot expect anyone that manage your investment or money to do that for free. Now, that being said, there's a, a few final mantra that I really want to, 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 to instill into you is that uh, ironically in investment, you must be willing to lose money before you even thinking of able to make money, right? Ironically, people who are willing to lose money, they will actually uh, uh, make money. People who are not willing to actually lose money, they always go for this scammy kind of high risk, high return investment, or maybe a scammy kind of investment. They are the one who cannot afford or not willing to lose money. They are the one who actually lose a lot of money because when they see something that's too good to be true, uh, they human psychology always are attracted by all these shiny, uh, shiny objects, right? So uh, do not, right? So just be realistic, right? And know what to expect. And do not forget that when it comes to investing, uh, dividends is always positive. Capital gain can be positive, or negative or okay, capital can be gained or lost. So don't forget whatever you want to invest in at the very basic minimum, it should have a very good dividend as a basic, right? So even if you don't make capital gain or you have a capital loss, your dividend will actually cover that, will actually offset that because dividend is something uh, that you can use, see and touch and tangible, right? That is cash flow. And there's no stock sector anywhere in the world that can get you consistent dividend, right? As consistent as REITs, real estate investment trust. So if you want to actually hop on to an online web session or virtual seminar, just you know, leave your comments below, check out the description below, right? And it's one I personally feel that, you know, uh, it's one of the best uh, stocks sector to invest invest in, in Malaysia and anywhere in the world, because even historically paying uh, good paying dividend stocks like uh, consumer goods, like house, in the most dire financial situation, they could actually say that, hey, I'm going to suspend the dividend payout for, you know, for this quarter or this year because, I'll, you know, we need to conserve the cash flow, right? But the thing is, if you're depending dividend, you know, for your retirement and all that, just like your pension, right? If one year no dividend, basically, uh, you have to liquidate your capital now. That is really not desirable. But like I say, REITs is the only sector that no matter rain or shine, yes, the dividend amount could be, you know, could be lower, but it still will be obligated to give you dividends. So, which is why, you know, as the time of this, you know, uh, of this lesson, you know, fixed deposit rate is only about 2% or less than 2%. You want to get like 4, 5, 6%, you know, of a so-called a dividend. It's not hard to get, you know, uh, from certain stock which has dropped in value anyway. But more importantly, how consistent are the dividends? And, you know, it's only so few sectors, only, only one sector that can actually give you, the, still give you dividends no matter what. And that is what I just told you. That being said, um, this is uh, CF Liu. I hope you have gained valuable insight from this lesson, how to invest in Malaysia, specifically the best stock sector to invest in Malaysia. I'll see you in the next lesson.